Okay, here's a problem where we have a uniform rod that's four meters long. They don't give you the weight of the rod, but they just call the weight of the rod W. And they also suggest that you're going to hang a ball of the same weight W from that rod at a distance X from the wall. The interesting thing here is that the rod is not attached to the wall. The only thing holding the rod to the wall right there is friction. They're wondering how far away from the wall you can place the ball of weight W without the rod falling or slipping off of the wall. Again, it's just friction holding it there. They give us the coefficient of static friction between the rod and the wall, and that's 0 0.50. They don't give us the tension in the cable, but they do give us the angle that the cable makes with the rod, and that's 37 degrees. Again, the question here is how far away from the wall can we place a weight W, a ball of weight W, so that the rod doesn't slip and fall away from the wall, and again, it's not attached. So because this is in equilibrium and it's not going to slip, we can say that the sum of all the torques equals zero, and the sum of all of the forces equals zero. Now we're going to have x forces and y forces. Now as you approach this problem, there are several things I want you to be thinking about. First is when you solve a problem with torque and things are in equilibrium, you need to be thinking about where do you want your pivot point. You get to choose where you want your pivot point, but you want to be smart about it. It's always good to choose your pivot point or your axis of rotation at a place where there are lots of unknowns. Because let's say you have an unknown force at your pivot point. Well, because the distance to the pivot point at the pivot point is zero, you'll also have zero torque there. Let me say it again. The distance to the pivot point when you're at the pivot point is zero. And then when the distance is zero, your torque is zero. And so it's nice to be able to cancel out one of your torques at the pivot point, especially at a point where there are lots of unknowns. Do you see where that beam or that rod is touching the wall? I feel like that's where the most unknowns are. We don't know the reaction forces in the wall. We don't know the normal force right there. We just, all we know there is a coefficient of static friction. We don't have any other information. So I decided to choose my pivot point or my axis of rotation right here where the rod hits the wall. You also could have chosen it at the other end of the rod because you don't know the tension force, the force in the cable. And, you know, there's a lot that's unknown down here too. However, we are going to have to define a lot of our forces, like defining W, the weight of the ball and the rod, in terms of tension or vice versa. So I really don't want to cancel out the tension as a variable, we really are going to need to use that variable, especially because they gave us 37 degrees. So I'm not wanting to get rid of T as an unknown. I'm wanting to use T as an unknown in our equations. So I'm not choosing the pivot point down there where T is creating some torque. Another thing I want you to think about right off the bat is the trigonometry at the point where the cable meets the rod. So I'm going to draw this tension, and the tension is pulling up, obviously, which means that this cable is pulling over and up. So we've got an x component of the tension, and we've got a y component of the tension. So we know that there's an angle of 37 degrees, and just to make things easy, we're going to say that your x component of the tension is going to be your hypotenuse, times cosine of 37 and your y component of your tension is going to be your hypotenuse times sine of 37. Now whenever they give me a coefficient of static friction I immediately like to acknowledge friction itself. The force of friction equals mu times the normal force. There's the equation that looks like fun. And so we know mu is 0.50. We don't know the normal force and we don't know the force of friction. But at least we've got something written down that we can work with. Now as you know from other problems, when you have a million gazillion unknowns, you're going to create multiple equations. 
and substitute one equation into the other. If you've got three unknowns, then you need three equations, and you'll substitute one equation into the other until you end up with only one unknown, and you'll be able to solve for that unknown, which will unlock the other two unknowns. In this problem, we have a T for tension, which I'll just give you a little hint, it's going to end up canceling out. But we've got T for tension, we've got W, the weight of the ball and the weight of the rod, which I haven't drawn yet in the free body diagram, but I'll draw it in a second. And we don't know our normal force, we're going to have to define an equation to define our normal force. And we don't know our X and Y components of T. And then finally, we don't know X, the distance that the ball is hanging from the wall. Let's go ahead and draw the weight of the rod itself, W. And we know, luckily, the length of the rod is 4 meters. So I would like to go ahead and say, if the rod is 4 meters and the center of gravity is at the center because it's a uniform rod, we're going to say that the distance to the center of gravity of the rod is 2 meters. Let's look first at the sum of all the torques. We know that because it's in equilibrium, the sum of all the torques has to equal 0, which means your clockwise torques will equal your counterclockwise torques. Let's think about what's creating clockwise torque. If our pivot point is right here on the left, then I would say the weight of the ball is creating clockwise torque, and the weight of the rod itself is creating clockwise torque. So the clockwise torque would be W times X, the distance from the pivot point, plus W times 2.0, which is half the length of the rod. Nothing else is creating a clockwise torque. The counterclockwise torque is created by the tension in the cable itself. However, when you do force times distance, and as you know, torque equals force times distance, the force and the distance must be perpendicular to one another. So we need the component of the force that's perpendicular to the rod. In our tension triangle, that will be our y component. We've already defined that y equals t sine 37, so we're going to say that the component of the tension force perpendicular to the rod is T sine of 37, and don't forget to multiply that by the distance from the pivot point, which is 4.0 meters. Let's go ahead and pull a W out of this equation and say 2.0 plus X equals, and let's get sine of 37, 0.602, Let's multiply that by 4. 2.41t equals w times 2.0 plus x. Let's look next at the sum of all of our forces. Because it's in equilibrium, the sum of all of our forces must equal 0. We're going to have to do the sum of all the forces in the x direction and the sum of all the forces in the y direction. So let's first look at the x direction. The tension in the cable creates a horizontal force in the x direction, pushing the rod against the wall. This would be also considered your normal force. So the x component of tension is going to be the normal force, which is the rod pushing against the wall. And because of Newton's third law, for every force, there's an equal force in the opposite direction. The wall is also going to push back on the rod with the same amount of force equal to the normal force. And so I would like to say that the x component of the tension, t cosine 37, is actually equal to our normal force. So if we say that the normal force equals t cosine of 37, now cosine of 37 is 0.8, so we can say that the normal force equals 0.8t. This is going to be a very useful equation for us later when we plug one equation into the other. Let's look now at the sum of all of our forces in the y direction. Remember now, we're not talking about torques, we're talking about forces. So we'll just use the forces without the distances. In the downward direction, we've got 2w. The ball and the rod itself are creating the total force downward. That's got to equal the forces in the upward direction. Would you agree that the y component of the tension is one of the forces lifting up on the rod? I have it drawn here at the left end of the rod as if it's coming from the wall. But in reality, where the tension cable is connected to the rod, that is where the Y component of that tension really exists. So we'll say Y is creating an upward force on the rod, 
and the force of friction is creating an upward force on the rod. The force of friction being the force at the left end of the rod holding that rod up. The force of friction is down here at the left end of the rod and it is an upward force preventing the rod from sliding down. We know that y equals t sine of 37. We know that the force of friction is 0.50n or 0.50 times 0.8t, which we found n to be equal to. And on the left side of the equation, we just have 2w. We can now solve w in terms of t. 2w equals 0.602t plus 0.4t. Divide both sides by 2 and w ends up being 0.5t. We can take this equation and plug in 0.5t up here for w. The cool thing is that the t's cancel and now we can solve for x. x turns out to be 2.8 meters. Again what we did is we used the sum of all the torques equaling 0 we came up with an equation. We used the sum of all the forces equaling zero. We came up with a sum of all the x forces and a sum of all the y forces. And we ended up solving for the only unknown that they asked for, which was x. I hope you enjoyed this. This is Jen at youreallydolovescience.com.